Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Claire. So uh, uh, I thought I would uh, use some uh, time to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, uh, big debates uh, which um, uh, took place in the uh, panel. And even though the uh, panel came out in uh, you know, one side of these uh, debates, and that's reflected in the panel report, my guess is that these same debates are going to uh, uh, continue and uh, uh, who knows what the uh, final outcome uh, uh, will be on that. So the, the, the first of these big debates I would call the, uh, uh, the, the question of whether the post-2015 agenda should be sort of an MDG 2.0 a kind of a, a refreshed and modernized NDG for the, uh, uh, you know, uh, modern times, but still one with very much a core focus on human development, on poverty eradication, uh, a, uh, uh, a fairly limited focus with the idea that uh, by replicating the strategy of the MDGs, we could really uh, uh, continue to make significant progress in that agenda and recognizing that there's still an awful lot of work to do in terms of uh, achieving the MDG targets in uh, many countries. And so there were, there were many proponents of that as being a, uh, uh, a really useful approach to the post-2015 uh, agenda. And then on the other side, I think there was a uh, group that uh, felt that um, that would be um, uh, too limiting, that it, uh, the way in which the MDGs had been implemented in practice had not actually looked at uh, uh, development as being a, uh, uh, a system of progress. It was trying to uh, carve development out into uh, just a few things and therefore had actually left out a lot of really important issues. And among those important issues were the whole environmental agenda, uh, the whole set of issues about the uh, relationship of people living in poverty to natural resources and uh, uh, assets, uh, the livelihood that they got from uh, uh, assets, the growth agenda, infrastructure, the institutional agenda, access to, to, uh, to, to justice, uh, uh, freedom of uh, information and media, uh, and, uh, 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 and a whole agenda around personal safety and violence and discrimination and, uh, you know, a range of other things that in the, uh, the consultations that uh, we had were clearly uh, integrally related in, in people's minds to the concept of poverty. It was, it was almost part of their definition of poverty. And so there was this big question, well, how can we really have a, a poverty agenda which doesn't include these things? So there was a, you know, a, a, a big and I think very healthy uh, uh, debate on that. And uh, ultimately, um, as I hope you see from the panel report, we came out on the side of the uh, more inclusive uh, uh, agenda. And so, you know, all of these things are included in the uh, uh, panel report. And obviously the risk of that is that it, uh, it dilutes focus to a uh, certain extent. But the benefit of it, I think, is that it uh, suggests that uh, if progress is made on these sets of issues, then we will actually have made progress on all of the things that really do affect poverty. That's important because if you want to have as a you know, a really core part, the eradication of extreme poverty, you have to think about poverty in a dynamic context, not just about uh, the ability of people to lift themselves out of poverty, but also about protecting them from falling back into poverty. And we know from the uh, statistics that there's a great deal of churning in our typical measures of poverty, meaning that, you know, even if the number stays at a billion people, the the billion people who are poor were poor in 2010 are not the same billion people or 1.2 billion people who m might have been poor in 2005. So, you know, you, you have to deal with both the, uh, the, uh, the 
outflows and the inflows into poverty at the same time. And it was felt that taking this broader agenda, including concepts like resilience, uh, would be a really important way of doing that. The second observation I wanted to make is that um, the panel report was just one of a handful of different reports that all came out at the same time. So the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network came out with a report, the UN Task Team had a report, Global Compact had a report, and then any, you know, a, a large number of uh, NGOs were also uh, uh, producing uh, reports on their views of what the, uh, uh, the goals and targets should be. And I would say that if you looked at the overlap in terms of substance, substance at the broad, you know, health, education, poverty, gender equality, food and nutrition, there was a, there was a I, I don't know, 90% overlap in terms of the, uh, the, the core content. Where there was a huge amount of uh, disagreement was on the details. What were the words that were going to be used to describe what you're going to try to do in, take, education? And where in this big space on education were you going to set a few priorities? And there were big differences, I would say, uh, across the various reports in how those should be treated and big debates within the panel on exactly how to frame that. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because at the end of the day, the, the power of the goals and the targets to mobilize action, to, uh, 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 to, 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 to get people to behave in different ways comes from the language that's used, the acceptance, the buy-in. And some people pitched it at a high level of aggregation. Some people would pitch it at a very detailed, narrow, specific. So, you know, how you do it actually matters a lot. And that's where the fiercest arguments are. So it's not about really, uh, you know, trade-offs between different sectors. You know, I, I can't think of any real report that said, let's not have, let's say, access to infrastructure in there, or let's not have education in there. They, they all did. But the way in which they actually dealt with these issues is quite different. And, and that becomes really important when you think about the political process of coming to an agreement. And, you know, who is going to be in the room when that political consensus is finally formed? Because if you think about these goals and targets as being used to mobilize campaigns and mass movements and be uh, creating accountabilities and pressures on governments, you might have one group of people in one type of language. And if you think about it as being a intergovernmental negotiated consensus agreement, you're likely to get quite a different type of uh, language. So I, th I think that the nature of the language actually goes to the heart of what impact will these goals and targets, which, you know, at the end of the day, have, have no force of law. There's nothing, there's, you know, these are just soft norms that people are agreeing to in an international forum. So there's a certain degree of moral suasion that they bring with them, but cer certainly no degree of legal commitment. And then finally, um, I wanted to say a few things about what next. So we have the panel report, but the panel report didn't deal with everything in the post-2015 agenda. And there are uh, at least four things that I think are, uh, uh, you know, important pieces that uh, still remain to be uh, articulated. The first is the whole set of issues around implementation and accountability. 
Uh, I think there was a sense with the MDGs that accountabilities were not very well defined, except for some developing countries themselves. I mean, there were a whole range of sort of quite specific things that in some sense people said, well, developing countries have committed themselves to achieving this. But almost everybody else was left, left off the hook, including official development agencies uh, and including non-governmental stakeholders. Uh, I think this time round there is a uh, desire to see whether accountability can be built into the process in a uh, more structured way, whether one can start to have a discussion about the comparative advantage of different organizations uh, and uh, whether one can uh, uh, define and w through, through a process of transparency define what it is that each agency will actually hold itself accountable for. The second um, kind of underdeveloped uh, part of the report is around um, uh, finance. With the MDGs, there was a very important financing conference at Monterey, which in some sense provided the, uh, the glue for the agreement and the consensus to take hold. Uh, some of you may not remember, but when the MDGs were agreed on, they did not have the uh, full and active endorsement of a number of developing countries who basically said, okay, so, you know, somebody else is telling us what to do, what's in it for us? And in some sense, the answer to that was, the financing is in it for you, and that's why the financing conference was such an important part of that, um, uh, 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 of, of people taking on board the MDGs in the way that they did and striving to implement it. This time around, we need another financing for development conference. Of that, I'm absolutely convinced. But I'm also convinced that it has to be of a very different nature. It can't be a pledging session in the way that the Monterey conference was by and large a pledging session. And uh, you know, in fact, there was an entire industry of how much will the MDGs cost. That probably wasn't terribly useful. So uh, with luck, we'll avoid that uh, this time round. That said, there are a number of really important issues about whether the way in which global finance is structured is actually helpful to the development process or whether it constitutes a structural impediment to achieving the kinds of results that we want. So that has to be worked on, I think, uh, uh, much more. And that's where all of these sets of issues around tax evasion and tax avoidance and illicit capital flows and corruption, uh, uh, you know, get, uh, get uh, brought to the fore. Uh, the third um, issue which is still left a little bit hanging is what in the panel report is called the data revolution. Some people think that the data revolution implies, well, we just need slightly, slightly more and better data, and let's kind of fix statistical systems in developing countries. I, I, I think that's a bit of a misperception. The, the, the word revolution was used quite deliberately, and it was used to say that we actually do need quite a different approach to thinking about what kind of data we collect and how we use data to, as a feedback loop, to inform the way in which we do business. Uh, and right now, the, the, the time lags that are involved in the process of data collection, data evaluation, and then change in practices are simply way too long. And if you think about the way in which most modern, certainly businesses, think about data, but also NGOs that have their own metrics, there's much more real-time feedback and learning. And we haven't yet really figured out how to have real-time feedback and learning incorporated into development activities. That's going to be really important if we're actually going to be able to bend the curve, as the report calls for, and achieve what are 
quite stretch goals and targets as they're currently uh, uh, laid out. And then finally, I think that unlike the MDGs, which basically set global goals and targets, halve poverty, cut mortality by two thirds, which were in some sense applicable for, to all countries, not, not literally, but that's certainly how it was taken in practice. This time round, the panel report basically says countries need to figure out what targets they can really uh, uh, aspire to. That we should have a set of global social flaws, minimum levels. It's not acceptable, for example, for a country to say, well, we're going to try to do something about poverty, but we can't really expect to do too much by the year 2030. That's out. You've got to, everybody's got to try to get to uh, zero extreme poverty by 2030. So there are a number of indicators where that is the case. But then there are also a number of indicators where additional things are uh, being asked. And the reason why that is important is because it is that degree of country specificity that permits this agenda to be universal. So because of that universality, it will not be the case that the UK can just say, oh, we don't have extreme poverty, meaning less than $1.25 a day in the UK, so well, check the box. We don't need to do anything about poverty. They, they can and should be expected to do something about poverty in the uh, uh, UK as well, but using national metrics and essentially encouraging a race to the top in all these, uh, uh, in all these aspects. So it's a universal um, uh, agenda, but it has to start with a debate in each country. And right now, what we're having is lots of debates in New York. And that's pushing us back towards the, what I would call the older style, let's have a general sort of global agreement that at the end of the day, one will try to, uh, you know, shoehorn every country into this global agreement, despite the fact that some are, you know, that, that, that they are in such a hugely diverse uh, set of circumstances. And if that happens, then the whole concept of universality, I think, goes out the window, uh, because it is impossible to construct uh, a general uh, uh, kind of structure that is equally applicable to, uh, uh, to all countries. So let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots to get us started there. David.